uh, where we're welcoming on the screen Jesper Christiansen, who's the Chief uh, Commercial Operations Officer at Maritime Services for DP World. Um, and in the room, uh, we'll be welcoming Peter Hebblethwaite, who is the Chief Executive of P&O Ferries. We'll just let uh, people join the screen and the room. All right, Peter, just the one next. Your name's on that one. Thank you. Uh, apologize. So. <coughs> And there's some fresh water there for you as well. Okay, we'll get going. Uh, Mr. Hebblethwaite, um, when I was reading your biography, it seemed pretty light uh, on your experience as a chief executive officer. Are you in this mess because you don't know what you're doing, or are you just a shameless criminal? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and answer questions. Um, and actually, before I answer that question, can I start, please, with an apology? Um, actually, an apology to um, the seafarers that were affected on Thursday last week, an apology to their families, and an apology to the 2,200 of our employees who have had to face very difficult questions over the last week or so. Um, and you may see this as a late apology, and I just want to reassure you that the reason that um, you're hearing this, I guess, for the first time today is because I've spent the last week in the business talking to our people one-to-one -one in Why person. didn't you talk to them in advance in a consultation, Mr. Hebblethwaite? Why apologise after you've sacked them all? So the context of this incredibly difficult decision is that P&O has lost an unsustainable amount of money. And... The reality is, and this is the backdrop that I would ask you please to bear in mind, is that we would have had to close the business if we hadn't... I'm sorry to interrupt. I have lots of businesses come to my committee and tell me that, but they all consult before they make their staff redundant. Yeah. You didn't. Yeah, Why not? So we thought long and hard about the routes to this, and we did consider every single option available to us, and we concluded that every single option available to us would result in the closure of P&O. And ultimately, and I haven't uh, had a chance, and it would be great to talk to you about what this actual new crewing model looks like, but it is of such a, it is a fundamentally different operating model, and no union could accept um, Did you ask them? our proposal. Did you ask the trade unions? No. Okay. In your letter to the Secretary of State, you said that you notified the relevant um, competent authorities in Cyprus, the Bahamas, and Bermuda on the 17th of March. Is that correct? Yes. We heard earlier that that was in breach of your notification requirements to notify Cyprus within 45 days of the first dismissal and the Bahamas and Bermuda within 30 days. Do you recognize that? Not being a lawyer. Um, well, I presume you have access to lawyers, Mr. Of course. Hathaway. And, and, and we, we, we uh, are clear that we have not breached that law. Who did you write to in Cyprus? I will have to get back to you on Who that. Who did you write to in the Bahamas? I'll have to get back Who to you Who did you write to in Bermuda? Let me respond. Let did me you write. sign off these letters? No. Can you provide this committee with copies of them? Yes. Thank you. What's your salary, Mr. Hepplethway? My salary is a basic salary of £325,000. Do you have access to a performance-related bonus? I have access to two performance-related bonus. Um, a short-term incentive plan, the long-term incentive plan. Do you think Both you've increased or decreased the value of P&O ferries by your actions? I think that P&O was otherwise going to close and didn't have a future. And so if your employers are, might I suggest, mad enough to offer you a performance-related bonus, will you accept it or reject it? That is, I can't tell you how far that is from my thoughts. As a thoughts. point of principle, will you accept it or reject it? I don't know the answer to that. If we manage to save the company... As a decision for you, if I'm offering you a performance-related bonus and you've just sacked 800 people, will you, as a point of principle, say, I'm not going to take that? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not, I'm not, I, to, I've got to be honest, I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on saving the business and getting the 800 seafarers new jobs. Right. Um, you recognise that uh, asking your employees to sign a settlement agreement means that they are withdrawing their rights for further legal action against p and Yes, I do. And we, are, and we are making extremely generous payments as a result of that. £36.5 million, we think, the largest maritime um, settlement arrangement in history. 
uh, there will be people receiving upwards of £170,000, but actually oh, probably, really? um, uh, I, I don't know, a, a very few. Very there few. will be about 40 who will receive um, more than 100000 but most importantly, actually, is at the other end of that scale where we have capped the minimum. So if somebody started work with us in the last month or so, actually we've said that we will pay a minimum of £15,000. So we've uncapped the top, and we've absolutely said, as a minimum, we will pay £15,000. We recognise we did a very, very difficult thing. We recognise money isn't everything, but we do want to compensate people fully, and I absolutely want to be focused on getting them all new jobs. Thank you. Uh, Mr Christensen, on the screen, please, from DP World, the owner of P&O Ferries. Are you going to sack Mr Hebblethwaite for gross misconduct? I couldn't imagine that we would do that, no. And did you sign off on these proposals? So, um, DP World has been informed on a continuous basis on the uh, situation in P&O Ferris, obviously, as the, uh, as the shareholder. Did you sign and off? We've also been, and we have, we have also been informed of the evaluations that P&O Ferris have had in terms of different routes to making this business viable and sustainable, and eventually also being informed and supporting the decision that was then eventually taken. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Hepplethwaite just said, uh, Mr. Christensen, that P&O Ferries is about to presumably go immediately bust unless you sacked 800 members of your staff. You'd, do you agree with that assessment? So the business, P&O Ferries, um, has <laughs> definitely lost a lot of money over the last few years. No business can sustain that forever. The business was not viable in that, uh, in that situation or in, under those conditions. So a number of things have been evaluated and eventually this model was then chosen as the only route uh, available uh, as an alternative to um, ending up in liquidation or uh, it's, it's very strange, Mr. Christensen, because lots of other businesses in trouble follow perfectly legal routes, but um, you seem to be having no regrets about the decisions taken by your business. The last question for me, whilst I've got you, Mr. Um, 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 Mr. Chairman, uh, with all your respect, uh, uh, having no regrets, you have not heard me saying that we have no regrets. We would, you like, would you like to express also, that? Uh, also, also, as DP World, we acknowledge the pain that this has caused to a lot of people, mm -hmm. employees, see Ferris, their families, etc. So you're not heard me saying that we do not acknowledge that thing. Well, I'm sure Please. the families are grateful for your regrets after sacking them, Mr. Christensen. My last question for you is I understand that DP World owes £146 million to the Merchant Navy Ratings Pension Fund. When are you going to pay that? I don't know if the 146 is the right number. Uh, I have no, I no knowledge of that. I understand it is, and I also understand that you... I'm not... £147 million pounds sponsoring a golf tournament, so it should be affordable for you, shouldn't it? May I add a point? Please. So the uh, liability for the pension fund, as I understand it, is a P&O liability, and we have um, an agreement, and we will honour those agreements to make those repayments. Thank you. And DP World will be giving you the money to do that, presumably, given you don't have any. Well, sadly, the reality is this was a very difficult step that we had to take to make the company viable and profitable, at which point we will all be able to honour our own commitments. Very good. Andy MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Christensen, uh, you talk about um, this being painful and difficult. Uh, the company paid out $376 million uh, in dividends to shareholders in the last two years alone. Couldn't you use some of that money to treat the workforce at p and with some decency and dignity? Don't you think that was your duty? So DP World has taken absolutely zero dividends out of P&O Ferries for the last many years. You, you, you so we have, we, on the contrary, we have kept on supporting the business over and over again, supporting the uh, existence of that okay. business for well, a number of years with hundreds of millions of pounds. Okay, without regard to the welfare of the, of the workforce. Um, uh, Mr. Hepperthwaite, uh, did p and have a duty to, to consult the unions in good time over the redundancies pursuant to Section 188 of the uh, Trade Union Act of 1992? There is absolutely no doubt that we were required to consult with the unions. 
We chose not to do that because we believe... You chose to break the law. Because we chose not to consult, and we, will com and we are and will compensate everybody in full for that. I recognise that this is a really When difficult... you get in your car and drive down the motorway and you see the 70 mile an hour sign, do you decide that that's not going to apply to me, I'm going to do 90, uh, because I think it's important that I do that? Is that how you go about your life? No. No, it isn't. Did the collective in agreements in place between P&O and RMT and Nautilus provide for negotiation over such matters as redundancies? All right, could you rephrase the question? D you had collective agreements Correct. with RMT and, P uh, 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 and Nautilus. That provides for negotiation over such matters of redundancies. You've done it before. Why didn't you do it? What was the moral justification for you not doing that? Okay, so this is, these are very extreme circumstances. Let me, can I, in order to answer that question fully, can I explain the difference between the operational uh, model that we previously had and the one that we are moving to so that you understand how fundamental a change it is? And that helps me explain why we had to take the route we had to take. Would you allow me I'm to sorry, do that? Sorry, as, as the Chair has already pointed out, there's many companies that have difficulties. They obey the law and they consult with their, with their members through, through their trade unions. You haven't done that. We've moved from one operating model to another. And you, haven't, you haven't escaped the law of this country. You've still got to do it within the legal framework. You can't just decide that you're going to absent yourself from the legal system of the United Kingdom. It, is, it, is, it was our assessment that the change was of such a magnitude that no union could possibly accept our proposal. Oh, you're and right about that, that, that Mr. 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 I've never heard <laughs> such farcical answers to a series of questions. Okay, look, can I move on, Chair? Um, in selecting UK employees, most of whom will be UK nationals or residents, uh, or residents uh, when you select them for dismissal, P&O has evidently discriminated against them on grounds of nationality. What was the legal justification for doing this? To be clear, actually these weren't exclusively UK nationals. Uh, they were largely UK nationals, but this, is an, this was an, a group of international um, employees. So what are the new rates of pay to be offered to the new crews? How much are you paying them? The two, models, the two models are very different. So to answer that question is a bit more complicated, if you can allow me the time. The previous operating model required us to have four crews for every ship on Dover Calais. The new operating model um, uh, re requires us to have two, ship, two crews and pay people when they work. So they're, they're assessed in slightly different ways. The answer to your question is that the average Jersey seafarer was, in, was paid £36,000 and will receive £46,500, so a year and a third in compensation. So that's part of the answer to the question. The second part of the question is, what are the hourly rates of pay uh, for the new model? So the average hourly rate of pay is £5.50. On top of that, there is a pension contribution. There is food yeah, and accommodation. Pension contribution. That's more than minimum wage. And then, sorry, can I make a couple of points, please? So on the routes that are international routes that are governed by ITF standards, we are paying above ITF minimum wages. And on our domestic route, which I think was referenced earlier, Lyon, Cairn, Ryan, where we are governed by national minimum wage, of course we are paying national minimum wage. And, and so, uh, so the seafarers aboard the vessels that are leaving Dover, the replacement crew, they're going to be paying on, a, on average, paid at the rate of £5.50 per hour. Yes. That's below the national minimum wage of this country. How do you, how do you reconcile that? Where we are governed by national minimum wage, we will absolutely pay national minimum wage. Oh, this is an international sure. seafaring model that is consistent with uh, models throughout the globe and our competitors. Do you live on it, Mr. Hubble, for £5.50 an hour? Could you, could you sustain your lifestyle at £5.50 an hour? No, you couldn't, could you? Why do you expect people who've got such responsible jobs to be able to do that? How do you expect them to be able to feed their families and pay their bills at £5.50 an hour? So a couple of very, very important points here. One yes, it, it's one one's is called the, gas, one's called electric. Those are the important points. They can't pay their bills. A couple of important points, please. Um, these, uh, the seafarers who join us are international <coughs> professional seafarers 
with all the international certification. These are, these are experienced seafarers. I'm going to move on. I'm, I'm going to move on. Can I, can I ask uh, Mr. Christensen? Because, Mr. Christensen, on your website, DP World, you say the DP World respects and supports the human rights of our employees. You go on to say, amongst other things, in relation to collective bargaining, DP World respects the laws and labour practices for each country and will not hinder the development of means for independent and free association. How do you square that with the experience of your company, p and Sorry, I, you, the line was breaking up. Well, One more time, please. The latter part of the question. Well, you, you'll be familiar with your own human rights statement, uh, which yeah. adheres to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the ILO Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, the Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, and yet you've completely trashed them. In this, they're not worth. Are you going to take this down off your website because it's an insult? So I do not uh, believe that it's an insult, and I do not believe that any of what we have done. Uh, 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 piano you need to ask decided. the 800 people yeah, that is, you've... In is in conflict. Is in conflict with any of that. Of course, it's a direct conflict. I, I, you know, we hear some ridiculous things, but for you to say that those those principles still obtain when people have been summarily dismissed without no notice whatsoever and replaced by people on five pound fifty an hour is an outrage. There's some NDAs here, Mr. Hepplethwaite. Are you going to rescind those? Because, quite frankly, the members of this committee think this is absolute thuggery. Uh, and criminality. You're behaving like gangsters to blackmail people in this, into this situation. Will you withdraw those NDAs and let people have the freedoms that we all enjoy? I assume you're talking to, about the confidentiality clause that's in the severance agreements? Gagging agreements, yes. It's a standard confidentiality clause and actually it's there to, to protect both sides. Oh, oh God. Um, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm just getting into the end of this. Um, let me just ask one, one more. Um, you imp why did you employ private, a private security firm to remove seafarers uh, from your vessel? Were you, were you pleased with what you saw on, the, on our televisions, on social media, of people with handcuffs marching up the gangplanks onto these vessels? Why did you do that? So I, I, I don't think you have seen pictures of people in handcuffs because actually it was very clear we did employ a security firm of professionals and actually what I uh, and the reason for that was to keep our people and the ships safe and the reality is coming out of this is that we have didn't get a single incident throughout the day we kept everybody safe everybody secure Mr. Hepplethwaite, people were terrified. They were going about their work in the ordinary way to see people invade the ships and start ordering them about, telling them that they had to pack their bags and go. Is that a humane way to treat loyal employees who have given you such incredible service? Is that decent? So the security team were there to keep the ships and, most importantly, the people safe at a time that was genuinely a stressful time for them. It was our assessment that that it's was stressful because you made it stressful you were the author of the stress there's no doubt that when people hear that they are losing their job it is extremely stressful and we wanted to keep the ships and most importantly our people safe thank you thank you kevin newlands please uh, thank you much chair i, th I think just to uh, come back on this can you perhaps clarify for the committee and to everyone watching and to um, the penal workers what employment law provisions have you breached so we have not consulted, and for that, we are fully compensating people for that in full up front. And how much, and how much is the business going to save um, each year by sacking the crew summarily and uh, employing agency staff? So this entirely different model is about half the price of the previous model. About half the price? Yeah. Um, and you said the, the average... Um, wage of the uh, of the seafarers in the new model. What's the lowest minimum uh, lowest hourly rate in the new model? Five fifteen. The lowest. Yeah. Uh, the, you said in answer to Mr. McDonald, the average was five pounds fifty. Is everyone from the bottom? Fifteen. Five fifteen. Yeah. Five? So five fifteen. The average range is from five fifty to about six pounds, depending on exchange rate. But I gave you the low end of that. Five pounds fifteen. And and do you think that's 
a, a fair wage? Do you think the international maritime laws in terms of wages are, are fair and sustainable, or as many people now, look, now see it as modern day slavery? Which, what would you say to that? So the rates that we're paying are in line or above ITF minimum standards, and it is, and it is the, it is the uh, operating model that the vast majority of operators across the globe work to. So this is the competitive standard. I appreciate that, but do you think the ITF standards are, are fair and reasonable? Is that something that the world, perhaps in light of this, that your action, um, are, are going to have to look at and address? I think that they're negotiated rates of pay, and therefore um, you know, those have been successfully negotiated on both parts. Well, I'm not sure how successful it was in the workers' part, and to, to, to be perfectly honest. Um, over the last year, have p or, or indeed DP World broached with any government minister or official uh, that you may be changing practice at any point? Not an official notification of what you, what you did last Thursday, but any hint or indication as to what you might be doing or looking at? So I can share my understanding, uh, but I wasn't at the meeting. Uh, so I believe that on the 22nd of November, the Secretary of State for Transport was visiting Dubai. And at Expo, he met with uh, some of the DP World exec team. And that as, as part of a broader ranging discussion, which included ongoing investment in the British economy, the subject of P&O ferries was brought up and that we would be needing to make some changes to our business this year. Beyond that, I can't confirm. All I can say is that at that point in our planning, we hadn't finalised our plans. So I doubt any conversation went further than that, but I don't know. I appreciate that the final plans hadn't been made, but, um, but that's quite an important point you've just raised. Could you perhaps look into that and, and provide the committee with more detail on that meeting? Because the fact that the, the government perhaps were warned that something was a foot months in advance um, is quite an interesting point uh, the committee might want to know. Can I turn my attention to, um, to Mr Christensen? Um, is this, has any other DP World company ever undertaken such an action? Is this standard practice for DP World or is this a first? I don't know, to be quite honest. Uh, in the period of, that, of time that I have been occupied with DP World, uh, I do not uh, think that there has been anything um, similar to this, but we've also not had a situation in the company or in the businesses that is owned by DP World that is similar to the one that P&O Ferris has been finding itself in. Well, just for clarity, could you perhaps again write to the committee just to confirm that indeed this is the first time a DP World company has, has undertaken this sort of action. <coughs> and for DP, the, the impact on DP World, are you concerned um, what this might mean for DP World and its relationship with the UK government uh, moving forward? And uh, as we understand it, you have an agreement in place with the, the government with regards to free ports. Um, do you think this will have an impact on that uh, uh, agreement? So uh, I am responsible for the maritime activities in DP World um, and cannot speak for what that means to other parts of the business. But I can assure you, as we have done, both Mr. Hebblesweith and me in this uh, session, that we have taken a lot of consideration to the decision that was taken here. p and Ferries Board have been coming to DP World, uh, consulting with us on on this we've been informed we have made everything that we could to make sure that that all proper care was taken we have taken on everything that we can do to make sure that uh, the people affected are being looked after so yeah of course we have taken into consideration that that, that this decision could have some kind of impact um, um, beyond uh, piano ferries but still we have had uh, uh, Given or we have given the piano ferries the support for that decision under the prevailing circumstances. Did you did you essentially force PO to take this decision, or was it just a, a broader they must save X million? Sorry, one more time. Did, the line did, did, deep, did DP World force PO to take this decision? So PO ferries is a um, business in its own good right, and the PO ferries board will have to take the business decisions for p and ferries that it has to take. So DP World is interested and, and, and obviously focused on 
making sure that our businesses are viable, whether they are in the one corner of the world or the other. Uh, but at the end of the day, the operational decisions in PO Ferries is PO Ferries to decide upon. Okay, thanks. And back to you, Mr. Hebblethwaite. Did you anticipate such a reaction? Well, can I also just confirm Mr. Christensen's point? This was a PO Ferries board decision. We, of course, required funding and support to do it, but ultimately this was a P&O Ferries decision. This was not forced on us or even suggested to us okay. by DP World. But, um, sorry, your question was? Um, what was my question again? <laughs> <laughs> Were you expecting this reaction? Yes. Oh, sorry, I do apologise. Thank you, Mr. Bradshaw. Um, the reaction to this has been extremely yes, strong. Sure. There's no question about that, and I... I, I do regret that, and I recognise it. I really, really do recognise it. But there was no P&O without the changes that we needed to make. So um, we anticipated this would be very difficult, very controversial. And, and lastly, for me, for a hand back to the chair, are you not concerned that these actions will actually bring about the end of P&O rather than save it? I think we've got a tough job to do now to rebuild the business, but I think a... P&O with a future and a P&O that is able to uh, be competitive, pay its own bills and offer the customer service that is uh, required has a much better chance. Thank you. Um, I, I'm afraid I have indications for questions from literally every member of the sure. committee, so, uh, sure. apart from you. So I'm going to call you all, but please just keep your questions and answers tight and keep it moving, please. Nuzrat Ghani. Thank you. Mr. Heberway, you is it accurate that you said the Minister was informed on the 27th of November? 22nd. 22nd of November. It's my understanding. Which one? Which Minister? Secretary of, sorry, the Secretary of State for Transport. If I misspoke, I apologise. You have a minute of that conversation? I don't, know. Thank you. What a mess. What a mess. So P&O ferries have been operating since 1844, and then in one Zoom meeting, you, you trash it all, trash it all. 800 people now on the dole. And um, you're now trying to clean this up, having ruined the reputation of P&O ferries and undermined everything we're trying to do in the sector, even encouraging people to come forward and become seafarers. And you're saying that you've got a number of regrets. I've just seen, been sent a picture of Pride of Kent where, I believe, crew that you've dumped on the door, all of their bits and pieces are in bin bags. Why have you done that? Why don't you fix that right now? Why don't you fix that right now? Make sure that the people that you've fired have some dignity and get hold of the items that they've left behind. Can you fix that right here, right now? So actually, I've already taken steps to see what has happened there, and I have been assured. So we will find out the specifics of that <laughs> photograph, but I have been assured that um, the team are taking personal responsibility for returning people's belongings to them. Take them out of the bin bags and give them back to the people they belong to. Give them some dignity. The, so can I just... the. Uh, bags that people were given was on the day so they could have something to carry off the possessions that they could carry. The, re the possessions they're otherwise taking, we're returning to them and we're employing companies to do that and box them up and return them. So you would have heard from the early session the anxiety that we have that the MCA will be able to credibly allow the ships to sail and you've come forward to say you've got a number of regrets and we would have hoped that maybe you're going to be treating the new crew a little bit better. I've had, a, I've had messages over the weekend from people on board and this doesn't give me any confidence you're going to treat the new crew any better. Um, so the message say the replacement officers were not informed they were replacing crew being made redundant. Um, we were told that a new company is being set up and that it could possibly be from Glasgow. Um, no representatives from P&O were present when they were on board the ships to brief the new officers and we've had no direction from P&O as to next steps to take. You must understand the fundamentals of managing a passenger ferry service. Surely you've been told and briefed. This gives me no confidence that the new crew have confidence in, in the leadership or even your leadership or whether they think uh, the, the ferries are, are competent to sail. What's going on? It just seems to get worse every day. So, a uh, couple of things. Um, we did employ a professional security firm to talk to people. We had to talk to them all at the same time. Uh, you mentioned a Zoom call. So the nature of this crewing model is that at any one time, half of our uh, seafarers were on board and the other half were at home spread throughout Europe. And so we wanted to inform everybody at the same time. So people on board, where at all possible, we spoke to them in person. 
people who were not and who are at home and spread throughout Europe, we had no option but to invite them to a Teams meeting that was, uh, there was a live meeting. Yes, it was scripted, but it wasn't pre-recorded. I think that's important. And then we followed that up with one-to-one -one phone calls where we could get hold of them, and of course we followed up in writing. Replacement officers. Yes. Why have they not been given one-to-one -one meetings? Why have they not been spoken to by PO leadership, PO Ferries leadership? We've, had, we've been on board. In fact, we've had some of our fleet management team and our, um, and, our, and, our, and our ships support services have actually been living on board the ships to help with the familiarization and the training. Um, we, I've been on board. I've spoken to the new crew and the new officers. We've had 51 officers ask for uh, the paperwork to join the crewing management company uh, and come back and help rebuild the business. Can I ask why you didn't come forward to the department to ask for more advice or guidance to try and get you out of the situation you felt that you were in? So we, uh, we, think we felt it's important that we were able to have a viable ongoing business and we needed to move to a competitive operating model that is recognised throughout the world and our competitors also use. Um, it was a very, uh, it was a very difficult, very difficult step we had to take, and all of my regrets around it are around the impact it's had on the individuals. But I do recognise it is a step we had to take. Um, we didn't talk to really very many people at all because of the nature of we knew it was going to be controversial and it needed to be confidential because without that confidentiality we simply wouldn't have been able to implement this incredibly difficult decision. Did you change anything, knowing what you know now, what you did last Thursday? That's a really, really difficult question. The business would close. The business was not viable. This is the only way for us to save this business, and we have moved to a model that is internationally recognised and widely used across the globe and by our competitors. I... Um, I would make this decision again, I'm afraid. Wow. Um, just one quick clarification before I go on to another member. Um, you said, Mr. Hepplethwaite, to Ms. Garney that you had a discussion with the Transport Secretary on the 22nd of November. Um, I didn't uh, have that. I, didn't, I wasn't part of that discussion, but I believe that, um, that a conversation was had in Dubai at Expo on the 22nd of November. With who? With... Secretary. Secretary. Who, was, who was the Secretary having a conversation with? It wasn't you. Who was it? Transport. Sorry, the, so the, the transport secretary had a discussion with somebody in Dubai. Yes. Who? I, uh, some some senior execs at DP World. I don't know who who I wasn't there. Mr. Christiansen, who had that conversation with the transport secretary in Dubai? I don't know either. Uh, I was also not participating in the. Presumably, in the you session. can find out for us and let us know. Yes, and I think uh, yes. I think that Mr. Newlands asked us to do that. Thank you. Great but can nice. I can I please reiterate at that point? Our plans were nowhere near finalised, so it is unlikely that that conversation would have had any real substance to it, I suspect. <laughs> you didn't participate. Okay, Graham Morris, please. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Chair. Um, you, you, you may recall, uh, Mr. Hebblewhite, previously, all oh, this is a joint committee with the uh, yeah, uh, transport and buys, uh, there was an invitation um, from transport to, to, uh, to come to our committee. We were looking at COVID support during the pandemic, and there was a change in the chief executive at the time and that wasn't possible but that was arising out of the COVID support the company received and the I think the, the freight grant as well it was around about 15 million pounds but uh, th it was also because a number of redundancies had been announced affecting a number of ports uh, uh, where p and Fraser were involved what, what was different that you were prepared to respect UK law and consult with the recognised trade unions on that occasion and yet weren't prepared to do it on this occasion? So it's quite a lot that was different, but it's a good question. So um, during the COVID uh, pandemic, during the height of it, we anticipated it would come to an end in the early part of 2021. And we anticipated that we would be able to restructure the business with limited redundancies and that that was a reasonable um, conversation, and we absolutely consulted with that. The COVID pandemic has gone on much longer, and we now need to fundamentally address the viability of this business. Otherwise, it closes and 2,000, an additional 2,200 people lose their jobs. 
And so in this situation, we will need to change our operating model. And on that basis, and I know, I, I know the reaction I got last time, but it is true that we assessed that given the fundamental nature of change, that no union could accept it. And therefore, we chose not to consult because a consultation process would have been a sham. And we didn't want to go put anybody through that. And we want and we, want, and we are and we are uh, compensating people in full and up front for that decision. Uh, do you have a name for this new operating model? The, the, the new operating model that you're applying with the with the reduced crewing and so on in the... I mean, it's, it's, it's called multiple things. People call it agency crew. Um, I, 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 talk, I talk about running our, our crewing bus through a crewing management company. I've heard it rather cruelly referred to as the skeleton um, um, crew um, model. I think, that's, I think it's really dangerous that, we, that, we, that, I, that I let that lie. These are very, very experienced, fully certified, professional international seafarers. Just them decent wages then. I know, I know time. Yeah, we're well, uh, on 50 an hour. I know, I know time's well, sorry, really short. I'm going to have to move on. I'm so oh, sorry. Right. I'm so sorry. I'll Jeez. call you in the end, at the end if I've, if I've got time. Paul Howell, please. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. I, I, I just find it bizarre that, um, you know, as a business, you've chosen to break the law as a business decision. It's just, it's, it's incomprehensible to me. Um, you know, P and O are now a laughing stock. You know, I think, I don't know whether you'll find that it's your Duran Ratner moment in terms of a business. You're seen as contemptible by any right-minded people as to the way you're running your business. I really don't understand how you think that um, the government or anybody else is going to want to engage with P&O or DP World in anything with any faith or any trust that you're going to do anything that you, you say that you're going to do in future. Um, with, with hindsight, do you really think this is a sustainable way to have your future? Do you think that this is, is a viable way to run a business? I think that we weren't viable before. And I know that if we hadn't made radical changes, the business would have closed. And I know I keep repeating it, and I apologise for that. But genuinely, that would not have been 800 redundancies with substantial severance packages. That would have been 3,000 people losing their jobs and the impact on 3,000 people throughout multiple <coughs> nationalities. And, uh, Mr Christensen, um, you, know, you made the comment earlier that um, you know, it's a it was a your part of the business that was involved in this, and that, that uh, I got the impression that the broader DP world um, assessment wasn't fully considered into this. And it was, you know, you, you talk about not it being associated to the, the teams that are involved in the free ports type agendas. Do you now regret that? I mean, it seems to me as though what you've done is you've exposed your entire business to contempt, not just the risk of P, of, of P and O going down. Do you have any sen uh, regret of that, from, a, from a, even just from a pure business strategy point of view? Let, let's, let me once again stress that this decision was also not an easy one for us to, um, um, you know, sign off and support uh, um, in terms of P&O barriers. <laughs> of course, it wasn't. Um, I think the commitment and of DP World to the UK uh, economy, about billions of pounds of investment in terminals and uh, free zones, etc. You know that 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 commitment, I think, is is second to none. I mean, we have not invested more funds anywhere else outside of Dubai than in the UK, and the commitment to you know. Ferries and therefore also a British icon. Somebody mentioned uh, back to 1847. Uh, yeah, that the commitment is also a part of us being very observant to, in this case, that that we have done everything that we could to make sure that people were taken care of. Um, it was also noted uh, a little bit earlier that the packages that have been offered to the affected employees that they are funded uh, out of DP World, and, and they are. And therefore, that has been very important to us to make sure that we did everything we could to support support the people who were affected by this. That is a, a, you know, also a commitment that we do to make sure that, no, that, that doesn't make the decision any easier, but at least we have, have taken it very seriously to try to make the impact as 
bearable, if I can use that word as possible. Uh, 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 just, well, just to wrap it, Chair, I mean, it really just, it, 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 I think it's bizarre that you think that the right way to do it is to buy your way out of, of, of following UK law, and I think that that's just something that will come back and bite you. Sorry, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Simon Jack, please. Thank you. Mr Hablethwaite, you've said in this session that what you've done to 800 working people, including people in my own constituency, was necessary to save P&O. Stinks. You might have avoided financial bankruptcy, but in the minds of many customers, you are morally bankrupt. What have you done to the brand? So, no question, the brand has taken a hit. There's no question about it. I don't deny that. And, and, you know, we did something that was incredibly difficult and we knew was going to be controversial. But we now have a business that we can rebuild and grow. A competitive, modern business. Um, I am very, very sorry to those 800 people and their families. Um, but otherwise, the whole business would have closed, and we would have lost a British icon, and 3,000 people would have lost their jobs. And that is the background. The icon's this. mired, though, now. The, I the icon's mired in, in this, this disgraceful behaviour. How will you recover your brand? It's no longer an icon. It's not a British icon anymore. It's not, it's not something we're proud of. Well, I, we have a future now. We, wouldn't have, we, do you, we don't have to close the business. Do you really think I really, you've got a future? Do you think the customers will want to buy tickets from you knowing what you've done? I really do. I think it will take a while. I do think that there is a hit to our business, and I am, again, incredibly sorry. But we do have a future. We do have a business that is now competitive, that now can meet the customer needs and can pay its bills. Are so you hearing from your booking systems that people are cancelling tickets, uh, cancelling their trips? Yes. yes. To what extent? Uh, well, uh, we're not actually on sale, um, obviously, because at the moment we're not. But in the future, the future, the future tickets that have already been bought for things and trips that people were looking forward to, have they cancelled them as a result of this? Some people certainly have, and it's the, the reduction in bookings is different on different routes, partly because uh, people buy with a different, um, in a different pattern on different routes. So on Dover Calais, we uh, have taken a particularly large decline, but it's because those bookings tend to cut, be made two weeks ahead. On something like Hull Europort, where people make bookings three or four months in advance, we're still maintaining strong levels of booking, as we are on Lawn Ken Ryan. Okay. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, Chris Loder, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Hellthwaite, thank you. I have three very short questions for you. Uh, one, um, I do Just, I mean, they're ultra short. Um, you basically sacked employees and outsourced employment to agency staff, I think that's the correct assumption, uh, to approximately a third of your workforce. Um, that is bluntly also to UK citizens. Could you just tell us briefly why you haven't done that to French citizens or Dutch citizens, why it's just UK citizens? The, the vast, vast majority of our crewing model was employed through Jersey. We have, I mean, it, it might be double figures of French employees and we have very very, very few numbers of Dutch employees. So this was about... Easy to sack them here, that's why. Yeah. <clears throat> OK. okay. Um, where is your office based? I have an office in Dover and I have an office in Hull. Could you just tell us why your ships are flagged in Cyprus, Bahamas and Barbados when they sail from the United Kingdom? So this predates me by some way, uh, but there was a change made and I believe that the uh, move to Cyprus was... Um, to do with our maintaining our um, commitments to the French tonnage tax that we have. Okay. Thank you. And very briefly, um, I'm assuming you risk assessed this enormous change in your business. And I'm assuming you had a safety risk assessment. Could you tell us what the result of that risk assessment was and whether or not you actually uh, shared it with the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency? So, um, one of the reasons for engaging this security firm was to keep everybody and our ships but most importantly everybody safe and I have to reassess I have to restate and I think it's a really important point that with all the rumors out there the reality and the facts are that we didn't have a single incident can I just be clear with you I'm talking about your ability your license to operate this is what it's about 
have you risk assessed the enormous change and have the MCA signed off that risk assessment? Because in my opinion, I cannot understand how you can continue to operate ships safely in a way where you completely remove your workforce and the MCA have not signed that off. And I, I'm sorry I didn't ask the early witnesses that question specifically, but I don't think that's been signed off. So let me just confirm a couple of things for you. We engaged with the MCA before we uh, before the 17th of March, we engaged with them first thing on the 16th. Uh, could, can, please let me finish. The assessment is the question. Please so, OK, so I'm specific, the specific thing, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, let me find out. But can mm. I just reassure so, you about... Mm. The, just finally, I'm sorry, sis, and Chen, I'm just about to finish, so I apologise. But do you mean to tell this committee that the Chief Executive of PNO has not signed off a safety risk assessment for massive change... In, it, in your business, is, am, I, am I right in saying that? All of our team have been on this. I haven't seen the risk assessment. I will, I will get that would back you, to would you. you can I, I hope the MCA are listening to this, because this is outrageous. I, I cannot believe that you can maintain your position, sir. I'm so sorry that you have signed off such enormous change and you have not directly seen the safety risk assessment. Mr Chairman, I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alan Brown, please. Um, Back, back to employment law, or it's, this is done under UK employment law. Could you do that under French law or under law of the Netherlands in terms of employment law, this type of mass sacking? I haven't explored that, so I don't know the answer to that. No. I'm not a lawyer, I'm afraid. And at no point you've taken advantage of more lax laws in the UK? So this was not a UK, the, the intention here was not the UK, the intention was to move from one operating model to another, um, as, I, I, as, as, I, as I hope um, I've explained. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ben Bradshaw? Sorry, clarification on that. You have Dutch and, and French-based staff. Yes, very have few. not been treated in the same way. Correct. Mm. So... But, they, but, but in fact, to be clear, they are a very small proportion of our overall crewing model. So why haven't you treated them in the same way? Because this was about uh, addressing a, uh, an uncompetitive and unsustainable crewing model that we have from um, our Jersey-based crew. It doesn't answer the question. It doesn't answer the question. Um, and then there was one final question from Graham. Thanks very much. The, the, we're looking for a remedy here, and the option that you've gone for the model that you've gone for must be hugely expensive. The recruitment costs, the specialist security firm, um, suspending operations so there's no revenue, uh, the costs of redundancy of the loyal workforce. Are there any circumstances, perhaps the threat of, unli of an unlimited fine, that would cause p and Ferries to think again and reinstate the workforce? As I say, the business was unviable and unsustainable and would have had to close had we not made this incredibly difficult decision and I'm genuinely deeply sorry to those people affected and their families. The answer is no. The answer is if we went back to the previous model we'd have to close the business. It is not viable. Thank you. Uh, Mr Hebblethwaite, at the beginning of this uh, panel I asked whether you either didn't know what you were doing or whether you willfully broke the law. You said to this committee today that you willfully broke the law. You chose not to consult, even though you know you should have done, but you decided to pay people off with compensation in order to break the law. Does that not give you concern that you're in breach of your legal obligations as a company director under company law? So as I say, I completely hold our hands up, my hands up, our hands up, that we did choose not to consult. That's quite amazing, isn't it? You're coming to this parliament and putting your hands up and saying you willfully chose to break the law. We did not believe that there was any other way to do this, no and we are compensating people in full. Okay. I agree. No, I'm, sorry. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but Peter Hepplethwaite um, and uh, Jasper Christensen, thank you for your time. We're now going to change the chair in order to start the ministerial session. I'm told I therefore need to suspend the session just for one minute. Order, order.